Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Monday. Yes, thank you, Lisa. If you would type your first name into chat for me. Thank you. Good to see everybody. Very good. I hope everybody had a nice weekend. We got some good weather. And you had your first exam to do for me. Um, I took a look this morning, just a brief look. Um, I'll be grading those um, today and tomorrow. So by the next time I see you on Wednesday, you'll know your grade on the first exam. It looks like just on the brief look that I had, it looks like um, many of you did quite well on it. Good job. Good job on the first one. Okay. Just about everybody's here now. All right, very good. And you also had some lab questions to do for me. And I apologize, I know there was some uh, confusion on the lab questions. I sent an announcement out, hopefully you were able to see that. I accidentally posted an older version of the homework and I had to fix that. Um, as you'll hear me say a lot, I have a love-hate relationship with Canvas. There are so many things that um, behind the scenes in Canvas that um, that can make it frustrating. <laughs> for example, I've been teaching for 13 or 14 years now, and um, every file I've ever written and posted onto Canvas is still there. So sometimes I'll make a homework assignment or a quiz, and I will name it, and I will match a name of an old file. And so Canvas will pull up the old file and put it in there instead of the new one that I just wrote. <laughs> so yeah, it can be a little frustrating sometimes, but I appreciate your patience. Um, I did have a just a quick housekeeping thing to talk about. Um, I did have a quick question from someone about the exam, and again, I haven't graded them yet, but um, when you take these exams, obviously if it's a multiple choice question that you're answering, you'll know right away whether you got it right or wrong. But if it's a short answer or an essay question as Canvas calls them, um, I have to grade that one by hand. And so you don't see what score you got. The other thing to know is that if it's a bonus question, if you get it right, you get zero points for it in Canvas because it's a bonus. And so I have to go through by hand and give you credit for it. So if you noticed, for example, that you got a green correct next to the bonus question on your first exam, but you didn't get points for it, <laughs> don't worry. That's Canvas. That's Canvas because Canvas Canvas considers a bonus question to not be worth anything. It's not gonna to contribute to your 80 point score. It's gonna be extra if you got it right. And I'm the one that has to put in the points that you've earned. So just something else to know about the strange things in Canvas. All right, very good. Well, today, this week, in fact, we're gonna be talking about staining Today, we're gonna to talk more generally about staining, and we're gonna talk about what's known as simple staining. It's the simplest way that we use stains in the microbiology lab. We'll talk about um, some of the theory behind staining, and then we'll talk about how, how you do a simple stain with one of the most common stains that we use in the micro lab. On Wednesday this week, we're gonna talk about the 
most common staining technique that we use in the microbiology lab. And that's called gram staining. Gram staining is named after a person. So the word gram is someone's last name. Now gram staining is more complex. It's not simple, but it is the single most commonly used staining method. Um, and we'll talk about why um, on Wednesday. But today will be all about simple staining. Now, before we get into the lab exercise, let's take a look at our to-do list for the week. So I'm pulling up that screen right now. You should see that right now. It should be um, our Canvas modules page. Here's the start here module. And I'm just gonna scroll down to the current week, which is right here. And I'm gonna click on our to-do list for the week. So we have two lecture topics this week. We're gonna be delving into cells a little more uh, in a little more detail this week. So you watched the cell as a lecture before the first exam. And this week, we're gonna break it down into prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells and the specific differences between them. You'll have two lecture quizzes as usual. The prokaryotes quiz is due by Wednesday at midnight. The eukaryotes is due by Friday at midnight. And here are our two lab exercises and the lab homework questions due by Sunday at midnight. So it's a pretty straightforward week for us. I'm gonna give you um, a piece of advice for this week. If you have any time that you can devote to doing some extra work this week, I highly recommend it. Because next week, week four, is a jam-packed week for us, okay? So if you have any extra time this week and you can get in an extra lecture, I really recommend it, okay? Let's take a look at next week's um, schedule. So here's the to-do list for week three this week. I'm just gonna scroll down to week four which is right here. And I'm gonna click on our to-do list. <laughs> this is a busy week, <laughs> okay? You have your next lecture exam next week and you have your first lab practical exam. Now, what a lab practical exam is, is just an exam on laboratory material. And the reason we call it a practical exam is because what we learn in lab is very practical. You're learning techniques. You're learning um, ins and outs of working in the micro lab, okay? So you're gonna essentially have two exams. Now the lab practical exams look very different from the lecture exams. And I'm gonna talk more about those on Wednesday but for now, know that the lab practical exams are much shorter in length. In fact, the one you'll be taking next week has 12 questions on it, okay? Versus lecture exams, which tend to have double that number of questions, right? 25 to 30 questions on them. So two exams, you have one lecture topic next week, and that's acellular microbes, microbes that are not made out of cells. There are two things that can cause disease in us that are not cellular. One of those things is viruses. Viruses are not made out of cells. That's why we call them particles. That's why technically anyway, Technically, they're not considered to be alive. Because remember what we learned in the cell theory. All living things are made of cells. And all cells come from other cells. Well, viruses 
are not made of cells. They don't meet the definition. They don't have a membrane around them. They don't have any cytoplasm. They may have DNA as their genetic material, but some of them have RNA as their genetic material, like the virus that we're all living with right now, the coronavirus. And finally, ribosomes, sorry, uh, viruses don't have ribosomes. They don't have those machines that help them translate their genetic material and make protein. Viruses are therefore not alive, technically. What they do is they hijack living cells and they get the living cell to do the work of replicating the virus. So you're gonna have this lecture about acellular microbes next week. And some of you may never have learned anything about viruses before this class. So again, I urge you, if you have extra time this week, to do that lecture as soon as you can and give it the time it needs. Now, there is a second type of particle that can cause disease in humans that does not, is not made of cells. And that second kind of particle is called a prion. We don't talk much about prions in here but we will introduce them in that lecture. Prions are actually proteins. They're misfolded proteins. Proteins that have assumed the wrong shape. And because of that, they're able to cause destruction inside living tissue. You may have heard of the most common prion, which is the one that causes mad cow disease. So two kinds of acellular microbes, virals, viral particles or viruses and prions. And that'll be in the lecture next week. Now I'll pull up our to-do list again. You'll see you have a lecture quiz on that lecture due by Wednesday next week, as usual. Then your lecture exam on three topics, prokaryotes, eukaryotes, and acellular microbes. Just like the first exam, the exam will open up at eight o'clock on Thursday morning, and it's due by Saturday at midnight. Now, we also have a lab. <laughs> On Monday in lab, we're going to learn about what we call aseptic technique. On Wednesday, we'll talk about microbes in the environment and how we measure them. Then you'll have your lab homework due again by Sunday at midnight. I have a, a recommendation here too that says, I highly recommend that you do your lab homework next week as quickly as possible after Wednesday's lab because that way I can grade it and get it back to you. So you can have it to study for the lab practical. The lab practical exam will cover everything that we've done so far in lab to that point. That's a long list of topics. But remember, in laboratory, we're talking about practical techniques and there's only gonna be 12 questions. So that means mm, about two questions per topic. So it'll be up to you as you're reviewing these labs to try to decide what the most pertinent material is that you need to commit to memory. Lab practical exam also opens next week on Thursday morning at eight o'clock, but you have one extra day to complete it. The lab practical exam is due at, by Sunday at midnight. And I always recommend that you take the lecture exam first, get that out of the way, and then do your lab practical exam. So very busy week. Do yourself a favor if you can, and do that acellular microbes lecture this week, if you can fit it in, okay?
<laughs> All right, very good. I will talk again about the lab practical exam on Wednesday morning when we get together. We'll talk in a little bit more detail about how to prepare for that exam. Okay. On your screen now, you should see the title slide for our lab exercise, which is simple staining. Our objectives for this lab today are to talk first about just the general staining process. What, what is the chemistry, in other words? What's happening when we put stain onto a cell? In the second part of the lab, we'll look at a short video that shows us how to prepare a smear, how to prepare bacterial cells on a microscope slide so that we can stain them and examine them under the microscope. We'll talk about how to heat fix a smear. We'll talk about a simple direct staining procedure. Then we'll look at some stain slides together and we'll practice identifying some bacterial shapes. Remember from um, the lecture about cells, we said that prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells can take different shapes. They, they have different sizes and they have different shapes. Eukaryotic cells have a lot of different shapes. It depends on what kind of tissue that you're looking at, what kind of cell shape you're gonna see. And you really see how the shape of a cell impacts its function in a eukaryotic organism, a multicellular eukaryotic organism. It's a little different in prokaryotes. There are fewer different types of shapes in, eukary uh, in prokaryotic cells. When we talk about bacteria, there's really only a handful of shapes, right? There's really only a handful. There's the caucus, that's the sphere, that's the round shape. There's the bacillus or the rod. That's the elongated shape. There's what's called a spirillum. That's a sort of a twisted shape. There's a spirochete. That's a spiral shape. And sometimes we see unusual shapes like vibrio. And a vibrio shape is a comma. It looks like a comma, sort of a bent rod. So yeah, really just a handful of shapes. The other thing we do re, uh, like to look for though, other than the shape of a bacterium, is we also look to see if they've gathered together at all. Remember we talked about that? Sometimes bacteria like to assemble themselves into little communities. Some bacteria like to join into chains. Some bacteria like to cluster together like, like a cluster of grapes. So we'll take a look at that today as well. We'll try to identify some cell shapes and also look for any of this grouping that we sometimes see under the microscope. So let's begin at the beginning. And that is the bacterial smear. The word smear means a thin layer of cells that we place onto a microscope slide. That's what we call a smear. Now, the key word is thin. When we're preparing a smear, we have to do our utmost to limit the number of cells that we're putting onto the microscope slide because we want to examine them. We want to be able to see individual cells under the microscope. So again, we can get their relative size and their shape. So it's critical when we're um, making a smear that we don't put too many cells on there. There's nothing worse than making a smear and just having such a cluster of cells that you can't see anything. This word fixation, this describes a process 
that kills cells and adheres them to the glass slide. That's what we mean when we talk about fixing a smear. Fixation makes the cells stick to the slide so they won't wash off while we're applying our stain. They also will, that process will also kill the cells. Now, remember, there are times when we don't want the cells to die because we wanna see if they can move. So that's when we would make a wet mount or a hanging drop. But if we're trying to examine the cells for their size and their shape, we don't want them moving. <laughs> we don't want them moving. We want them to hold still. So we purposefully, we purposefully kill them in order to do that. We adhere them to the slide and we kill the cells. These processes, these staining processes, they don't destroy the cell, they just kill it. So we will see it in its entirety, but any cell that's capable of movement will be dead. So it will no longer move. Now, there are actually two ways that you can fix a smear. One is by using chemical. And the chemical of choice is 95% methanol. So it's just a, a type of alcohol. And what we do is we make our smear and we put the methyl alcohol in a drop or two on top of the smear. That will again, kill the cells and make them sticky enough so that when the alcohol evaporates, the cells will be stuck to the slide. The more common method though is heat fixation. And that's the one we're gonna be using today in our exercise. Heat fixation uses heat to do the same thing that the methanol does, make the cells sticky so they'll stick to the slide. Now, why does fixation work? What is it about fixation that makes these cells sticky? Well, it does two things to the cell. Number one, it coagulates the proteins that are present in the membrane of the cell. Remember, membranes are full of phospholipids and proteins. And when you apply methanol to a protein or, or heat up, that protein, you're gonna cause it to change. You're gonna uh, change its nature. You're gonna make it coagulate. And that's gonna allow that protein to stick to the slide. The other thing it does is it denatures enzymes that are inside the cell. Now you might ask yourself why that's important. Remember enzymes are also made out of protein but they are proteins that are capable of performing chemical reactions. They are catalysts, in other words. When you denature an enzyme, you make it inactive. And what that does is it prevents those enzymes from starting the process of breaking down the cell. That process gets a name. It's called autolysis or auto lysis. If you break this word down, if you translate this word, it means self-digestion. There are enzymes inside of living cells that become activated when the cell starts to die. And those enzymes start to break down the internal parts of the cell. Now, if you heat up that cell and kill it by heating it, you will also destroy those enzymes. And that's good because we don't want the cell to be destroyed. We want the cell to stick to the slide so we can see it. So this process, this fixation process damages protein. It denatures protein. And all that word means, if you're not familiar with it, is it unfolds them. Proteins are all folded up into very complex three-dimensional shapes. Remember, it's the shape 
of a protein that determines its function. If you change the shape of a protein, you will change its ability to perform that function. So when we unfold or denature those enzymes, they won't be able to do their job. Uh oh, the police dogs are at it again. Neighbor dog is out. Yes, I would appreciate it. Could you get down? So back to the slide. Now, the way we heat fix a bacterial smear is pretty basic. You can do it on any hot surface. So you can use an open flame or you can just use a hot um, surface, like I said, such as an incinerator. I'm gonna show you this process using an incinerator during the video I show you today. If you have an open flame like a Bunsen burner, you're simply gonna pass the slide through that open flame three or four times, just back and forth through the flame three or four times. That's plenty of heat. Remember, we wanna denature the proteins we want to get the cell to stick to the slide, but we don't want to destroy the cell. We don't want to burn the cell to a crisp. So through the open flame, back and forth three or four times. If you're using a hot incinerator instead, you simply hold the slide against the metal surface of the hot incinerator for 20 to 30 seconds. I usually heat fix for 20 seconds. That tends to be enough. That tends to be enough time. Now I have a really important note at the bottom of this slide. Put a star next to this. Only, only heat fix dry smears. Now, as you're going to see in the video today, we typically make our smears using a liquid bacterial culture. So we use one of those broth cultures where the bacteria are growing in a liquid. We take out a loop full or two, we put it onto the glass slide and sort of uh, rub it around and then we let it dry. Once it's dry, you can heat fix it. The reason that we don't heat fix a wet smear is because it's dangerous. Now, it's not dangerous to the cells. The cells are gonna die anyway. It's dangerous to us and our colleagues in the laboratory. The reason that, the reason that it's dangerous is because when you heat up, um, a small amount of liquid, like what you would have on your slide, when you heat it up, you run the risk of sending vapor up into the air that is carrying bacterial cells with it. You're literally running the risk that you're gonna vaporize your culture and send cells up into the air, cells that might not be dead yet, and those cells could potentially be inhaled, be inhaled by your colleagues. By Hold on just a second. I'm gonna have to deal with this, I'm afraid. Okay, it's not just the neighbor dog. It's the neighbor dog out loose, running around. So, you know, my dogs, because they are the neighborhood police, they have to alert the neighbors that there's a loose dog outside. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Lisa's asking a good question, which is, can you chemical fix 
a wet smear. So this is, um, let, me walk, let me talk through this, Lisa, and see if it makes sense. When you're doing a chemical fixation and you're putting the, uh, you put the culture on the slide, you take a loop full or two of the wet broth and you put it down on the slide, you can go ahead and put your methanol right down on top of that wet. <laughs> you can go right ahead. You're, you're gonna add liquid to liquid and that is not hazardous. What will happen is the methanol will evaporate pretty quickly and you'll end up drying the smear in about the same amount of time. And there's no risk of that being aerosolized because the methanol is a liquid as well. So the danger here is the heat. The danger is you're gonna put this little small volume onto something that's very hot, either a flame or a hot surface. And you can literally aerosolize cells out of that. So take home, the take home message is always dry your smear first. Make sure it's dry and then apply your heat. All right, on this slide here, we're looking at a couple of uh, tools that we use in the micro lab. Down at the bottom, you're looking at just a classic Bunsen burner and a microscope slide that has a smear on it. And that's what you're seeing in that sort of whitish gray area. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. Notice that the microscope slide is not being held by fingers. It's being held by a pair of forceps, a pair of metal forceps. It's always a good idea to keep your hands far away from hot things, just in case. You don't wanna accidentally come too close to the fire and burn your fingers. So good technique here. We're holding the slide with its forceps and notice that the slide is put into the flame right above the internal blue cone. See that cone in here? It's kind of triangular shaped. There's blue sort of orangey flame here, but inside the flame, there's a blue cone right there. And if you recall from chemistry, at the point, at the tip of that cone, that's where the fire is the hottest. So you're just gonna pass this slide through the flame once, twice, three times, maybe four times, and then you're done. That's enough heat to make these cells in this smear adhere to that glass slide. Now, up at the top here, you're looking at a metal cart with a handle, the handle's over here. And this black thing right here that's sitting on the cart, it has one, two, three, four, it has eight smears on it. This is um, basically a hot plate. It's what we call a slide warming tray. And sometimes when we make our smears, we set these slides onto the warming tray so that the smear will dry a little more quickly for us. You can imagine that there's nothing quite as frustrating as making a smear and then standing there and waiting for it to dry so you can heat fix it. Standing there watching it, waiting for it to dry. So you can put your, sl your slide on a warming tray it's warm enough to help the smear dry. It's not warm enough to heat fix the slide though. So what a warming tray does for us is it helps the smear dry. So we can then finish the fixation process. Not all microbiology labs have slide warming trays, but a lot of them do especially a lab where a technician might be making lots and lots of bacterial smears each day. It's much easier to just line them up on the warming tray and let them dry that way, and then go ahead and heat fix them one by one by one.
So this black tray is just warm enough to help these smears dry. And then we can take them to either flame or to a hot surface and heat fix them. Now, once your slide, your smear is prepared and heat fixed, now you're ready to do staining. The simplest kind of staining is what we're gonna talk about today, which is simple staining. All of these stains that we use are made out of different kinds of molecules that will confer different colors to our cells and to the components of the cell. Now, I couldn't, I couldn't name, I couldn't list for you all the different stains that are in use in a modern microbiology lab because there are just too many of them. There are some stains that are used very, very commonly. Those are the ones that we'll be talking about this summer. But there are lots of other stains that are very specialized. They are designed specifically for certain kinds of microbes. There are some stains that are only used for one kind of microbe. So there are many, many, many different types of stains that we use in the lab. They are all available commercially. Um, laboratories stock up on them so that they'll have them available when they need them. It's important that we understand the chemistry of these stains so we can understand exactly why they work. Why do they impart a color onto these cells? So Candy's asking a question, if you heat fix a wet smear, will it destroy the cell? And the answer is no. If you were to heat fix a wet smear, you would still do what you were trying to do. I mean, you would heat the cell up to the point where the proteins in the membrane and the enzymes in the cell would denature. And you would make that cell stick. Remember, the process of heat fixing is going to kill the cell. But if you do it correctly, you won't destroy it. You won't make it go away. It'll be sitting on the slide nicely for you. The problem with heat fixing a wet smear is that you run the risk that some of the cells will be sent up in a vapor. Some of them will stay, surely, and stick to the slide, but you'll lose some of them up in a vapor. And that's where the danger lies. The danger is not to the cell. The danger is to your colleagues. The danger is to you and your colleagues. Okay, good question. Now, when we, while we use the word stain to describe what we use in the lab, they're really just dyes the kind of dyes that you might use on textiles or yarns or fibers. These dyes are actually made out of salts. Now, remember from chemistry that all a salt is, is a molecule that is made by combining two ions. So when we hear the word salt, most of us think of sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is produced by a combination of a sodium ion and a chloride ion. Bring those together and you've got the salt called sodium chloride. There are lots and lots of salts. There's calcium chloride and potassium chloride and all other different kinds that I don't even know the names of off the top of my head. But each of our dyes or stains is also made out of some kind of salt, a combination of a positively charged ion and a negatively charged ion. Now, what makes them different from say table salt is that the ions in a dye um, have color associated with them. So that type of an ion gets a name. That's called a chromophore. A chromophore is an ion that has color 
associated with it. There are then positive chromophores and negative chromophores, just like there are positive ions and negative ions. You find positive chromophores in basic stains and negative chromophores in acidic stains. And that's the language that we typically use when we use dyes or stains. If you've ever known anyone who does any dyeing at home, um, some people, for example, will dye textiles at home. If you've ever done any tie dyeing, um, if you've ever dyed yarn or anything like that, you'll hear people who do dyeing, you'll hear them talk about acidic stains or basic stains. The word, those words refer to what type of chromophore that stain has. If it's a positive chromophore, again, here, let me pull the slide up. If it's got a positive chromophore in it, that's gonna be a basic stain. If it's got a negative chromophore in it, that's gonna be called an acidic stain. Now, here's what's important to know for us. Most bacterial stains are basic. So most of the stains that we work with in the microbiology lab use a positive chromophore. Those are basic stains. And the reason that most of our stains are basic is because of the nature of cells. The cell membrane, remember, the cell membrane is made out of phospholipids and proteins. And if you were to add up all of the charge, all of the charges in those two molecules, phospholipids and proteins, there would be an overall net negative charge. So membranes have a net negative charge associated with them. These positive chromophores are attracted to the negative charge in the membrane. The positive chromophore is gonna bind to the negative membrane. That's what makes it stick. That's what makes the dye or the stain adhere to the cell. Chemistry, that's all it is, positive and negative. Now you'll, you'll note that because bacteria have a cell wall around them, these chromophores have to be very small. They have to be able to pass through the cell wall so that they can get to the membrane and stick to it. So Lisa's asking a great question. Are negative chromophores the ones that you use for gram indeterminate cells? Now, we haven't talked about gram staining yet, but there are certain cells that cannot be gram stained. And the most notorious of them is the bacterium that causes the disease tuberculosis. The organism that causes tuberculosis, its scientific name is called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Its species name is tuberculosis. <laughs> so, that type of an organism can't be gram stained. So we call it gram indeterminate. And yes, there is a stain that we can use on those cells and it's called an acid fast stain. So yes, there are some stains that are acidic that have negative chromophores instead. And you would use one of those when you're dealing with a cell that's got some unusual properties. Mycobacterium tuberculosis does have a very unusual property in that it secretes a waxy material around itself. And we need the acidic chromophore in that case to um, bind to and um, illuminate the cell. Great question. So yes, most of our stains are basic, but we do have some acidic stains. We just don't use them as much. 
you would use an acidic stain when you had a particular reason for it. Um, the basic stains for us are helpful because they stick to the membrane. They stick to the negatively charged membrane. Now, when we talk about staining, we talk about one of two different types of procedures. There's a, there are simple staining procedures, and there are what we call differential staining procedures. A simple staining procedure, like the name suggests, is quite simple. It uses only one stain. And because it only uses one stain, it's going to stain the cells one color. A differential staining procedure, in comparison, uses multiple stains, one at a time. And what will happen is we'll stain different molecules in the cell, different colors. So when we talk about a particular procedure being a simple staining procedure, it tells you something. It tells you that we're only going to apply one stain. And when you only use one stain, you're only going to get one color under the microscope. In differential staining, we're going to use multiple stains. We're going to apply them one at a time, rinsing them off in between. And we're going to stain different things in the cell, different colors. You can imagine that in a differential procedure, you can get you know, more detail. You can also differentiate one thing from another, hence the name. In simple staining, everything's gonna be the same color, but it's still easier to see something that has had a stain applied than something that hasn't had a stain applied. And that's why we do it. A super common simple stain for a simple staining procedure is methylene blue. Methylene blue you can find in any microbiology laboratory. It is a positive chromophore, so it's a basic stain. And it's gonna stain the cells a lovely blue color and make them visible under the microscope for us. Now, the other terminology that we use when we describe staining procedures is whether or not they are direct or negative staining procedures. When you call a procedure a direct procedure or a direct stain, you're talking about a stain that stains cells. So everything we've talked about so far, I talk about the stain adhering to the cells. The cell is what's going to pick up the color. <clears throat> Excuse me. In a negative staining procedure, the stain is actually gonna stain the background. It's not gonna stain the cells. So in a negative staining procedure, when we look under the microscope, the cells are gonna be the only thing that aren't colored. And there are times when that is actually more helpful to us than to stain the cells themselves. So, we may have a simple direct staining procedure. We might have a simple negative staining procedure. It depends, but that's what the, those terms refer to. If we were using methylene blue, which is the stain that we'll take a look at today, we would call it a simple direct procedure because methylene blue is the only stain we use today and it stains the cells. So it would be called simple direct. All right. Any questions? You've had a couple good questions so far. Any other questions? Stains are actually um, not particularly expensive, which is good because we use a lot of them in the microbiology lab. Some of them are more expensive than others, as you would expect. 
Remember, stains kill cells. So it's important that if you need to examine a cell's motility, you do that first and then apply your stain. It's also really important to remember that stains are toxic to the environment, toxic to us and toxic to the environment. So we always wear gloves when we're handling stains and we gather up all our used stain and we handle it as hazardous waste. You never put stain down the drain. All right, we're gonna take a short break here. We're just at 9.52, so let's come back a few minutes before 10. 9.57, we'll say, <laughs> if we're gonna be precise. Uh, go ahead and get yourself a cup of coffee or anything else you need, and I'll see you in a few minutes.
Okay, everybody. If you would, just a quick type of your name into chat. Just your first name into chat for me. We'll do quick attendance, thank you. All right, very good. Okay. All right. What we're going to do next is watch a short video together. And in this video, it's about 10 or 15 minutes. What we'll watch is we'll watch a state, um, a smear being made and that uh, smear being heat fixed using an incinerator device, using a hot surface, in other words, instead of an open flame. And then after that, we will watch, uh, we'll take a look at some slides together and we'll see how we can interpret them. So I'm gonna share my screen. And what you should be seeing on your screen is a bottle of ethanol sitting on my kitchen counter. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start the video and then I'm going to uh, put it full screen so you can see it um, as, as well as possible. We start any of our work in the laboratory. Remember that we have to disinfect the work surface. The two most common disinfectants used in laboratories for this kind of disinfection are alcohol and bleach. We use an alcohol solution of anywhere from 60 to 90%. Typically it's about 70%. And we use a 10% bleach solution. Both of those things are rapidly bactericidal. They will kill bacteria on surfaces very quickly. And that's why they're so effective. So, with a squirt bottle like this, we simply um, apply the disinfectant to the surface and then clean it off. Make sure the surface is nice and dry before you get yourself going with your work. Remember too that you have to make sure you have all of your materials gathered before you begin. And first and foremost, we want to glove up. Um, these are nitrile gloves that I'm wearing in this picture. Um, I put this picture in because I want you to see that these gloves are a little. Sorry, let me try this bigger screen. We start any of our work in the laboratory. Remember that we have to disinfect the work surface. The two most common disinfectants used in lab. Sorry about that. Area on surfaces very. I'll get us back to the gloves. To that you have to make sure you have all of your materials gathered before you begin. And first and foremost, we want to glove up. Um, these are nitrile gloves that I'm wearing in this picture. Um, I put this picture in because I want you to see that these gloves are a little too big for my hands. You want to wear gloves in the laboratory that are not too tight or too loose. And generally speaking, when you look at the back of your hand, which is what you're looking at in this picture, you should be able to move your fingers and your thumb around and not get these very large um, folds. You don't want the glove to have a lot of extra space. You want it to fit against your skin, but you don't want to wear a tight glove. It's not good, it will cut off your circulation. Um, on the palm side of my hand, you can see there's just a, there's a lot of extra room in this glove. You can see the folds um, on my palm and along my fingers. But um, unfortunately, beggars can't be choosers. And right now, this is the only size glove that I have available. Okay, so I've gathered the supplies that we're going to need today in order to make a smear of bacteria for staining. And what you're seeing on the desktop here, I've got a bowl um, that is used only for staining purposes. 
Uh, I've got a dropper bottle with methylene blue in it, which is a very commonly used simple stain. I've got a, a, a clothespin here, and uh, I'll show you what we do with those while we're staining. I've also got my inoculation loop. Uh, this is an instrument that we use very often in the microbiology lab. It has an aluminum handle, and then it has a wire. And at the end of the wire, you can't really see it here, but at the end of the wire, there's a loop. Um, when you dip this wire into a culture, into a broth culture, you will pull up some of that culture within the loop. If you remember when you were a little kid and you used to play with soap bubbles, you would stick that little wand down into the soap bubble solution and you would pick up some of the solution inside the loop. And that's what we're doing uh, with an inoculating loop as well. Over on the right hand side over here, you can see an incinerator. This is an electric device that gets hot enough to allow us to uh, sterilize the wire on an inoculating loop. Now, in this test tube, I'm holding um, a nutrient broth culture. Um, it has bacteria growing in it, so I would have just pulled this out of the incubator, and I'm now ready to examine cells that are inside the culture. Anytime you pull a broth culture out of the incubator, one of the indications that you have been successful in growing bacteria is the cloudiness that you see in the broth solution. The broth starts off very clear. You would be able to um, hold a, a piece of paper behind it and read the writing on the paper. Um, but obviously, this solution is no longer clear um, because it has cells growing in it. Now, it's really important that when you're using an incinerator in a microbiology lab, that you go ahead right at the start of your day and plug that thing in. These do take a few minutes to warm up and they have to be red hot in order to work correctly. So I always plug the incinerator in right away when I get into the lab and I'm ready to start making slides. Note too that a lot of incinerators have two settings. They've got a low heat setting and a high heat setting. Now I happen to be using the high heat setting today, but uh, depending on the incinerator, the low heat setting might be just fine. Um, incinerators can get very hot. And sometimes having the incinerator on the desktop on high is just unbearable because it's radiating so much heat that it's making you hot sitting, you know, two and three feet away from it. So um, the reason the low setting is there is because some incinerators will get plenty hot on the low setting. So when we're ready to sterilize the loop, it's the wire portion of the loop and not the aluminum handle that we're gonna be putting into the incinerator. You can see that there is a metal plate on the front of the incinerator and then there's a ceramic tube that runs down into the device. Um, we're going to place the wire as far as it will go down into that tube for the purposes of sterilization. This, um, this picture is very blurry because I wanted to uh, focus in on the loop as it sits way down in the back of the incinerator. You can see that the ceramic surface actually will glow red hot when the incinerator is ready to go. And the wire, at least the end of the wire, where the loop is, is also glowing red hot. You need to achieve that in order to achieve sterilization. You've got to get that metal red hot. Now, as soon as you withdraw the inoculating loop from the incinerator, you're, the red hot color of the metal is going to go away. It's going to go right back to its regular color. But understand that this wire is burning hot right now. So the very last thing you would want to do is take this loop at this moment and put it into your broth culture because you will sizzle that broth culture and you'll kill a whole lot of bacterial cells. So instead, you just hold the loop 
in your hand and count to about 20. Just do a little mental count in your head to about 20. That's enough time for that loop to cool off um, to be safe to put into your culture solution. So remember when it's time to take out the culture solution with our inoculating loop, we want to make sure that we're handling the culture tube correctly. Remember, always with a gloved hand, we don't handle any culture materials with our bare hands. And we're going to always remember once we open a container that has pure culture on it or in it, we want to tilt it so we make sure not to allow any microbes to accidentally fall in. When you take the cap off, you want to keep the cap in your fingers. Don't put it down on the desktop. Um, you're going to keep the tube at an angle while you draw out your specimen. You can see I've got the loop here. Um, I'm not just sticking the loop right under the um, surface of the liquid. I'm going down about halfway into the tube. Um, that's just good practice. It's also good practice not to allow the handle of the inoculating loop to get too far into that tube. And that's because, if you recall, we didn't sterilize this handle. We sterilized the wire, or at least the bottom half of the wire. So try not to put any more of that handle into your culture tube than absolutely necessary. Okay. Once you have culture on your inoculating loop, you can place that culture on. Here, hold on just a sec. I'm going to reposition this so you can see it a little better. I'm a little off center here. Let's see if I can do this. That looks a little bit better. Whoops, that went a little too far. All right, let's see if this works a little better. We're still a little off center, but I think you'll be able to see it. And basically spreading that liquid out. Hold on. Practice not to allow the handle of the inoculating loop to get too far into that tube. And that's because, if you recall, we didn't sterilize this handle. We sterilized the wire, or at least the bottom half of the wire. So try not to put any more of that handle into your culture tube than absolutely necessary. Right. Once you have culture on your inoculating loop, you can place that culture onto your glass slide. And you'll see I'm doing circle movements, getting ever wider, and basically spreading that liquid out across the center third of the microscope slide. Of course, we have to let the culture material dry and all I've done here is I've set the slide down on a piece of paper towel. Um, notice that the slide is labeled. Um, typically when you're making a slide that you're, you plan on just looking at and then throwing away, um, the labeling is not important. But if you're making multiple slides, which is often what you're doing, you're gonna wanna label them. And certainly if you wanna save the slide, if you're gonna produce and stain a slide and you wanna save it, you're going to want to label it. So I have my initials. I have the date that the slide was made. I have the name of the organism that's growing in my culture. And that is uh, capital B for the genus Bacillus. And the species name is Subtilis. Um, and then finally, I wrote MB on this slide because I'm going to be using methylene blue as my stain. The next step in preparing a smear for staining is critically important. That step is called heat fixation. We're doing a couple things when we heat fix a smear of bacteria or other microbes. Number one, we're going to warm up the surface of the slide so that the lipid in the membrane of those cells will stick to the surface of the slide. 
this is such an important step and unfortunately sometimes it gets overlooked if you try to stain a bacterial smear that has not been heat fixed when you go to stain that smear you're going to wash the cells right off the slide so we heat fix to adhere the cells to the slide we also heat fix to kill the cells now the stain the staining procedure the stain itself is going to kill the cells too so it's kind of a double check that we've got the cells um, killed and stuck to our slide now one other thing to know about heat fixing and that's this you never heat fix your slide until it's dry so once you put your bacterial cells onto your slide and spread them out you've got to allow that slide to dry completely before you heat fix it and that's because if you lay a damp slide a wet slide against this hot incinerator like this you run the risk that you're going to aerosolize that liquid very quickly and you're going to send bacteria up into the air you don't want to do that so make sure the slide is 100 percent dry and then pick the slide up uh, preferably with a clothespin and this is the clothespin i showed you at the beginning of the video this morning um, the clothespin will allow me to hold this slide against the hot aluminum surface of my incinerator and keep my fingers far away <laughs> so you simply lay the glass slide right to the surface of that incinerator and leave it there for approximately 20 to 30 seconds once your slide is heat fixed it's time to apply the stain i'm applying a drop of methylene blue again to the center of the slide because i know that's where i placed my cells Now, don't be stingy with stain. <laughs> you want to make sure that that whole smear that you took the time and trouble to make is covered with that stain. So put the stain onto the slide so that it makes a nice puddle. All right. Stain is not expensive. So go ahead and apply it generously. And that way you're ensured that all of the cells will get exposed to that stain. Typically, when we're doing a simple staining procedure like this one, where we're applying that one stain and then we're going to rinse it off, it will stay on the slide for about 60 seconds. Now, every stain is a little bit different, and sometimes uh, it'll be a little bit longer or a little bit shorter, um, but generally it takes about a minute to stain a smear like this. Once that time is up, you get your stain waste container like that bowl I showed you a minute ago. You're going to take that container, you're going to hold your slide over it, and you're just gently going to rinse the excess stain off of the slide. Now, notice you don't see a big blue area on my slide, even though it's been stained. You're not staining the slide, you're staining the cells on the slide, and you're not going to see where those cells are until you put that slide under the microscope. Once it's rinsed, you can allow the slide to dry. Just one more word about stain. All of the stains that we use in the microbiology laboratory have to be disposed of correctly. They have to be collected into a waste container and treated as hazardous waste. So the reason that we work in these containers, these stain bowls or staining trays is because we want to be able to collect this waste stain and keep it from going down the drain. You can allow the slide to just air dry, but you can also use this material here, which is called bilbis paper. This paper is just a it's a thick absorbent piece of paper and it comes in. Um, pads so you use one of these pieces to just blot your damp slide um, and get it prepared for observation under the microscope all i've done here is folded the bilbis paper over and i'm just going to gently 
press it down onto the surface of the slide so that I wick up as much of that moisture as possible. It's important to know that you don't have to get a microscope slide completely dry after you've stained it. Um, if it's a little bit damp, that's not a problem. You don't want to rub the slide. You just want to blot it gently. You're trying to get up as much of the excess moisture as you can before you examine it. All right. Very good. So any questions about that? Any questions about anything you saw in the video? Pretty straightforward. Again, a lot of times when we're learning how to make smears, I think the biggest mistake that we make is we put too much. We put too much material onto the slide. So sometimes um, when I'm working in the laboratory with students, I'll see microscope slides that have a clearly visible blue, just blob of material in the middle of the slide. And right away, without even taking the microscope out, I have to tell that student that their smear is much too thick and they're not gonna be able to see anything other than just a mass of blue under the microscope. When you stain the slide, don't expect to see anything on it until you put it under the microscope. The, the slide's gonna look perfectly clear if you've done it correctly, um, because we want a nice, thin, thin layer of cells on top of the slide. All right. Let's get out of there again. And let's take a look at our first slide. And hopefully that's what you're seeing on your screen right now. So this slide, we're looking at underneath the 100X lens. So remember, that's a thousand X total magnification. And everything that you can see here that is stained this bluish color, those are cells, those are bacterial cells. This is a really nice smear. And the reason it's good is because, well, first of all, I can see lots of cells on it, but I can see some cells that are individual. They're just sitting all by themselves. In other places, there are lots of cells sort of gathered together, but there are plenty of places where I can see individual cells without too much trouble. Now, I want you to know, I want you to note that we are at the highest magnification on our microscope, right? We're using the 100X lens. And this is one cell right here that I'm circling with my cursor. So first things first, what is the shape of the cell? What would you call that? What do we call a bacterial cell that's sort of elongated like that? What's the name that we call that? Type it into chat for me. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have pollen in my throat today. Good job, type it right in for me. Okay, very good. Lisa's got it, and Brooke, and Sarah, and Amy, and Sapna, and Maddie, and Candy, everybody's got it, Elizabeth, Good job. It's a terrible, bacillus is a terrible word to spell. It's B-A-C-I-L-L-U-S, bacillus. Now the word bacillus means rod. So it's perfectly fine to call that shape a rod. And most people uh, who work in micro labs, they sort of, it's almost like, um, I hate to say slang, but <laughs> a lot of us just call those cells rods. They have a rod shape, but the scientific term for rod is bacillus. So you know that anytime you're working with a bacterium whose first name is bacillus, you know what shape they have already, right? 
This organism is named Bacillus subtilis. So I know just by the name that it's gonna have a rod shape. The reason it's called subtilis, by the way, is because it's a small rod, relatively speaking. It's sort of thin and long. So it got the name Bacillus subtilis. Now notice what you can and cannot see here. I can clearly see the shape of this cell. I can clearly see the shape. I can see in some places that one or two or even three cells have lined up next to each other. That's not uncommon. Notice what you can't see though. When I look at this one cell right here in the center, I cannot see the cell wall. I cannot see peptidoglycan. I cannot see the membrane. I cannot see um, the DNA. I can't see the ribosomes. I cannot get that kind of detail under a light microscope. Relative size and shape. That's what I'm gonna get for a bacterial cell under a light microscope. Now, on this slide, here's another smear. This is the exact same organism, Bacillus subtilis, but this is another stain. This is called crystal violet. It's another basic dye, but I want you to notice the difference. Here's the methylene blue, here's the crystal violet. Methylene blue, crystal violet. You can really see this one is more blue. This one is more purple. It doesn't matter. It's just preference which one you think is a better stain for this organism. Some people prefer that blue. Some people prefer the more dark, the purple color. It doesn't matter. They're both simple stains. And whatever you happen to have available, is gonna allow you to see this organism more clearly underneath your microscope. Now on the crystal violet smear, I have fewer cells overall. Remember this was the methylene blue. Here's the crystal violet. I like this smear even better. And the reason is, is cause I can more clearly see here that these cells are sometimes getting into chains. Here's a single, well, this is a better one. Here's a bacillus cell right here that I'm circling. That's one cell. Look right above it. I've got a chain of them, two or three in a chain. I've got a chain here, a long chain right there. Here's another chain. There's another chain down here. Bacillus is an organism that likes to get into chains. It's a, it's a community of cells that are getting into chains together. It's part of the way that they live. It's part of the way that they communicate with each other is they get into these small groups and they form chains. So that's a common thing that you see when you're looking at any kind of a bacillus organism. Ah, here's another smear. Take a look at this one. This is a different organism. This organism, I have the name down here for you. This is called Bacillus megaterium. And this particular smear has been stained with what's called a spore stain. We are under the 100X lens again. Compare the relative size between these cells and these cells. We're under the same power lens. Look at the difference. This is a sort of a thin, fine rod. Look at these. These are thick, thick, um, just enlarged rods. Bacillus megaterium got its name because it's big, megaterium. It's a big cell, but it's a rod shape. Notice the chains. You can really see the chaining behavior here. 
Look at the length of this chain and this one here. Bacillus just love to get into these chains when they're in culture. Now, the other thing I want you to notice is that unlike this slide and this slide, there's something else you can see in these cells. The cell has stained purple, but there's an area in the center that looks pink. Can you see that? You can see it in this one. You can see it in these cells. Not all of the cells, but a lot of the cells have a central area that has not picked up the purple color. Instead, that it looks pink. Those cells were stained with a simple stain called spore stain. And what the spore stain will do is stain cells and show us if the cell is sporulating. Now, remember, bacteria are able to do a process called sporulation. Not all bacteria can do this. Only a couple types of bacteria can do this. And when it comes to pathogenic bacteria, when it comes to the kind of bacteria that cause disease, there are only two, two genera, the genus name, two genera that can sporulate. One is called bacillus and one is called clostridium. There are other bacteria that can sporulate, but they're not any, they wouldn't cause any disease in you and me. So there are lots of bacteria, for example, that live in the soil that can sporulate. There are lots of bacteria out in the natural world that can sporulate. But when it comes to the bacteria that can cause disease in us, there are only two genuses or genera that can cause disease. Bacillus, uh, sorry, that can sporulate. Bacillus and clostridium. Now, sporulation is a pretty interesting process. And if you're able to do it, if you're a bacterial cell and you're able to do it, it's pretty great because sporulation allows the cell to essentially go into a state of suspended animation. What's gonna happen is most of the cell is gonna die away, but the DNA, the genetic material will be left behind in a very hard impenetrable shell. Spores, bacterial spores are almost indestructible. The things that we use to kill bacterial cells, things like disinfectants and boiling and um, gosh, uh, everything up to even things like radiation, spores are resistant to. It's very, very difficult to destroy a spore. In fact, only autoclaving will destroy a spore. So, it's very important that when we're working with bacteria that can sporulate, we are very careful when we're sterilizing to make sure that uh, you know, we don't have any spores accidentally. When we're preparing surgical instruments, for example, they not only have to be cleaned, but they have to be sterilized in the autoclave, just in case there are any bacterial spores present. That way we're sure that we're not accidentally putting spores into our next patient. Now, the thing about bacterial spores, I said they're virtually indestructible, except for the autoclave. Once a bacterial spore finds itself in a nice, warm, wet, dark environment that's full of nutrients, it will revert back into its cellular form or what we call its vegetative form. That word vegetative just means cellular. So again, if I were to put bacterial spores into a wound, for example, the spore will return or revert to its vegetative state and it will become cellular again. Now we have found bacterial spores for example, in the wrappings, the linen wrappings of mummies, 
from ancient Egypt. And when those spores were brought back into the lab and put into a broth and put into the incubator, they reverted to their vegetative state. So as far as we know, spores can last forever. They can last forever. And if they come in contact with a good environment for growing, again, warm, wet, dark, lots of nutrients, they will go right back to their cellular state. It's amazing. That's an amazing trait to have. Now, the reason bacteria sporulate is because they find themselves in a poor environment. They find themselves in an environment that is running out of water, is running out of nutrients. Maybe waste material is building up in the environment. That is what triggers a bacterial cell to sporulate. And once it's in the spore form, it will stay there until it finds itself in a better environment, an environment that's conducive to life. So when you stain cells and you see those spores starting to form, it tells you something. This was a culture. This was a, a culture that was made in the lab. And these cells started to sporulate. And the reason they started to sporulate is because the culture got old. We put these cells into a tube full of broth and we put the tube into the incubator. And those cells will grow quite happily for a day or two. But after that, they will be running out of nutrients and there will be a lot of waste material building up in that tube. Once a culture is 48 hours, approximately, approximately 48 hours old, it's getting old. And the cells, if they can, will start to sporulate. So that's an indication when we look at a culture that we're purposefully making in the lab and we see cells sporulating, that tells us that culture's getting old. Those cells are not healthy and they're sporulating in order to save themselves. They're sporulating in, in order not to die. Now, if you saw that in the lab, if you saw that your cells were starting to sporulate, you can save that culture. You can still save it. <laughs> you can do a procedure called subculturing. And what you would do is you would take some, some of the cells out of that first culture and you would place them into some fresh media. You'd put them into a brand new broth tube and giving them, give them lots of fresh media and put them back into the incubator. When you subculture, you can keep a culture going for days and days and days. But otherwise, after two or three or four days, the cells are gonna die in your culture. Or if they can, they're gonna sporulate. And that's exactly what these cells did. They sporulated. So bacillus can do this. And another kind of organism called clostridium can do this. Now, when, when you look at one of these cells like this one, the pink oval that you see in the center of the cell, that's the spore developing. Now that spore will continue to develop until it is mature. And then all of the purple parts of the cell will disintegrate. Now, if you look very carefully right here on the slide, let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger for us. Right here, there's what looks like a pink cell right here. It's all pink. That's a spore. That's a fully created mature spore. Here's another one right here. So where you see purple and pink, the spore is still forming. Once the spore is completely formed, all of the purple parts will go away. Here's another one right here, another completed mature spore. Spores can last, as far as we know, forever. 
they will stay in a suspended animation. The DNA will be protected inside that spore for as long as time. And when that spore gets reintroduced to warmth, wet, uh, darkness, because bacteria don't like light very much, and lots of nutrients, that spore will return or revert to a cellular or vegetative state. It will become a cell again. It's amazing. It's an amazing trait that certain bacteria have. Now, I said that bacillus and clostridium are, can be, not all of them, but can be pathogens. In the lecture, we talked about bacillus anthracis, that's the one that causes anthrax and clostridium tetani. That's a bacterium that causes tetanus. So those are two really good examples of pathogenic bacteria that can sporulate and can cause very serious disease because of those spores. People get exposed to the spores sometimes. And when the spores come back into their body, they revert to a vegetative state and they cause disease. Very interesting trait, sporulation. So remember, spherical cells, a single would be called a coccus. Multiple are called cocci. A rod shape. You can call it a rod or you can call it a bacillus. There is a shape halfway between the coccus and the bacillus, and that is called the coxobacillus. <laughs> that's an easy one to remember. If you see a rod that's bent, looks almost like a comma, that's called a vibrio shape. And the last two are these twisted kind. There's a spirillum, that's what this one is. And there's a spirochete. Now the spirillum is um, singular, spirilla is plural. The difference between a spirillum and a spirochete is very subtle. At, at our level, at our, at our level of learning, I would not expect you to be able to tell the difference between a spirillum and a spirochete under the microscope. It's subtle, it's very subtle. The thing I will tell you is that a spirillum tends to be stiffer than a spirochete. The, the bends in it tend to be stiffer. I want you to think of a spirillum as being more wavy and a spirochete as being more helical. Spirochetes are much more flexible and they have many more twists and turns to them than spirilla do. But both of those shapes are very similar. And like I said, I wouldn't expect you to be able to tell the difference between one or the other. All right, let's look at some more. What I've got on this slide is a wet mount. And you might say, well, hold on a minute. I see some color in there. You do see some color in there. Um, we are on, we're underneath the 40X lens here. Notice the difference in size. Notice the difference in the size of the cells. This was 100X. This was 100X. This is 40X. See the difference? You can see these cells. What you see here in purple is a cell. You can see them, right, at 40X, but you cannot see them in any detail. You have to go to 100X to really see the size and the um, shape. Now, this is a wet mount. And all I did to make the cells a little bit colorful is I put a drop of stain at the edge of the cover slip, and I let capillary action sort of suck it underneath the cover slip. Enough stain to give the cells just a little bit of color, 
without actually making a smear. Now this is the same wet mount, but I've gone up to the 100X lens. Notice that it looks a little fuzzy, right? It looks a little fuzzy. You don't have the nice clear cells that you do when you make a smear and stain it. Compare this one to this one. Wet mount with a little drop of stain added, bacterial smear. See the difference? Now, again, if I was trying to examine mobile cells, I, I would want the wet mount. I would need the wet mount. But boy, if I want to look at the cells, at their size, at their shape, I need to make a smear and I need to stain it. Now, what do you think about, oh, by the way, we are under um, the 100X lens here, 100X lens. This is methylene blue again. That's the simple stain that we used. What do you think about the shape? Look for an individual cell. There are some good ones over here. And tell me what shape you think you see. Type it in chat for me. What shape do you see in those cells? Let me put it up again. I can see an individual, two individual cells right here. There's a third one above it. Here's one, two, three, four individual cells right here. I got a bunch of individual cells here sort of grouped together. What do you think about the shape? Ah, very good. Lisa, Amy, Sarah, Maddie, Candy, Austin, Elizabeth, very good. That's a caucus. That's a spherical shape. Good. Caucus is singular. Cocci is plural. Now, the other thing I want you to look for is, do you see any groupings? Does it look like these cells are forming any sort of groups or arrangements? Do you see any chains? Do you see any clusters? What do you think? Are these cells just randomly placed on this slide or do you see any sort of a pattern that you might that might be purposeful? There's a lot of cells on this smear, so it's kind of hard. I can tell you that when you see a big clump like this one, that's not that's um just because of how many cells there are on the slide. Whenever you see this really dark clumping, that's not what the cells are doing. That's an artifact from the way we made the slide. This one too. This is too dark and, and clustered. That's not real. The cells aren't forming a purposeful pattern here. But look right here, look at this group right here. And right above it, there's another one. Look at this group down here. There's maybe 10 or 12 cells there. And they're, they're just grouped together. This is a pattern that people describe as a grape cluster. Grapes, like grapes in the supermarket. People look at this and they think, oh, that looks like a cluster of grapes. That is an actual pattern that the cells are taking on. This is an organism called Staphylococcus. And one of the features of Staphylococcus is they just like to form these clusters. They like to get into these small groups, these little communities, and they just cluster. And you see that on your smears. So Staphylococcus, that's another organism where the name gives away its shape, Staphylococcus. And Staphylococcus just in general likes to form these little clusters on the smears. It's just their way of living in community. It's their way of communicating with each other and living together. Yeah, very interesting. So yes, Lisa, Lisa asked, is this a staph? And that's exactly, that's exactly what it is. That's a Staphylococcus. Now I can't tell you what species it is. I'm not sure what species of staph this is. 
there are lots of different types of Staphylococcus. But yeah, that's kind of a giveaway when you see it, those grape-like clusters. Good job, everybody. Now there's no ruler on this slide. There's nothing on the microscope, um, on this particular microscope that would help us determine the size of these cells. But remember, we're under the 100X lens. And I can tell you that each one of these individual cells, each one is less than or equal to about one micrometer one micrometer across in diameter. Remember, most bacteria are between one and three micrometers in diameter. So a caucus, typically about one micrometer. A rod would be maybe three, two or three. Now the spirochetes and the spirilla are longer. The spirochetes and the sprilla can be up to say seven, eight micrometers in length. But most bacteria are one to three micrometers. All right, let's take a look at another one. Ah, different color. <laughs> this is a stain called saffronin. Saffronin. And when you look at this slide first, we're under the 100X lens. It's hard to see individual cells. We've definitely got some clusters here, don't we? This is another Staphylococcus. I want you to look. Here's two cells side by side. Can you see that? Two cells just sitting side by side. These are cocci again. Here's an individual cell right there. Here's an individual cell right there. So again, this is another caucus shape. And this organism is clustering, clearly clustering. Okay. So this is another staphylococcus. Here we're under the 100X lens again. What do you think? What shape do you think we have? This is that saffronin stain again. It gives it a nice pink color. What shape? What shape do you think those cells are? Can you see individual cells somewhere? That's what you want to search for in that, in that image on that smear. Can you see any individual cells? Mm, it's tough, isn't it? <laughs> what do you think? What shape do you think you have here? And are they doing any kind of a pattern on the smear? What do you think? So Sap is saying spirillum. That's a really good guess but this is not a spirillum. I'm gonna show you a spirillum in a minute and you will clearly see the wave pattern. This is a straight cell, a straight organism. Lisa's thinking maybe a caucus in chains. Amy's seeing chains. We definitely have chains here. Yeah, we definitely have chains. It's hard to find an individual cell here. Amy's got it right. These are rods that are in chains. If, we, if you have a caucus that's forming chains, it will look like beads, beads on a string. You will be able to see that there are circles in that chain. If you can't see circles, you've got a rod in a chain. This is a very unhealthy culture. Let's go back and take a look. Even though I didn't use a spore stain here, I can see that if I look in one of these chains like this one, I can see that the stain, it, it picks up stain differently in different locations. In other words, some parts of the cells are darker and some parts are lighter. It did not stain uniformly. Now, right here, I've got one cell right here 
and another cell next to it. So I've got a chain of two, two rods here. Notice that there's some dark in the center of those cells and then light in the rest. Uneven staining is a sure sign that you've got an unhealthy culture. Over here, here's another longer chain. I might have five, one, two, three. I think I have five or maybe six cells here. Hard to tell though, because it's hard to tell where one cell ends and another cell begins. And that's because the cells are staining unevenly. When you see uneven staining, it might be sporulation. I need a spore stain to confirm that. But when you see uneven staining, again, in an organism that can sporulate, what you've got is sporulation beginning. Those cells are old. They've been in culture probably longer than 48 hours. They're starting to die. And they're doing the only thing they know to do, which is sporulate to try to save themselves. And this bacillus organism is doing that. Ah, take a look at this slide. This is an organism called Borrelia burgdorferi. And we are under the 100X lens here. So we're at a thousand X total magnification. Take a look at this slide. First of all, it looks quite different from the other slides we've looked at in that most of these other slides have a white background, right? The cells have color, but the background is very white. All right, that's because these smears were made with pure cultures. This smear was made with a patient sample. In other words, some kind of material that came out of a patient's body. So the, the background material is gonna pick up some of the color because it's got molecules in it. I mean, it's, it's, if it's sputum or perhaps it's joint fluid or perhaps it's urine, it depends on the type of body fluid you're looking at. But if you're looking at a sample that came out of a patient, not a pure culture, you're gonna see that the background also picks up color. But the cells are here. The cells are, are much darker. Take a look at those. Ah, these are very strange looking. These don't look like anything we've looked at so far. These are spirochetes. Borrelia burgdorferi is a spirochete. Now up here, what you're looking at here, it's very hard to tell, but this is two cells that have formed a chain together. Um, I've got a cluster down here. I've got maybe another chain, maybe some more clustering. Borrelia burgdorferi does not make a pattern. Unlike Staphylococcus or Bacillus, this organism doesn't make any kind of a repeatable pattern. It's a spirochete because it's actually got these, you, it's got these waves in it. And that's because it's a helical, it's a helical organism. It's elongated and it's twisted. Borrelia burgdorferi, it's quite a name. Does anybody know what disease this organism causes? Borrelia burgdorferi. Type it into chat if you think you know. It's a monster. It's a monstrous little bug. Causes a miserable disease in humans. Lisa's got it. This is the organism that causes Lyme disease. This is that little bacterium that we get passed to us through a tick and it can cause a miserable disease called Lyme disease. This is probably the best cell on the smear right here. And again, if you looked at this cell and you told me that this was a spirillum, 
I would say very good <laughs> because it's hard to tell a spirillum and a spirochete apart. I would not expect you to be able to do that. And by the way, this smear was stained with saffronin, that pink stain. Now take a look at this. This is a spirochete, but this spirochete is being imaged underneath an electron microscope. See the difference? Here's a light microscope. Here's one cell right there. Here's a spirochete under an electron microscope. And this is a scanning electron microscope. So we're looking at the surface, the surface of this cell. Notice it's really hard to see, but this cell is three-dimensional. It's helical. It forms a helix. In other words, it's not just waving up and down, it's twisting around and around and around all the way down. Spirochetes are long cells and they have many, many twists. That's what makes a spirochete different from a spirillum. These are spirilla, all right? Here's one cell right here. Here's one cell right here. See the difference? It's very subtle. These cells have just fewer twists and turns in them. They almost look like little worms, but they're not wiggling. That's not what's giving them the shape. This is just their natural shape. They have sort of a wave pattern in them. It's not a helix. It's more like a wave. They're more, I should say, they have less twists and turns and they're more stiff organisms. They're not quite as flexible as spirochetes are. It's a subtle difference. And it takes, some, it takes some experience at looking at them under the microscope to tell one from the other. But a spirillum has fewer twists and turns. It looks a little more like a wave in the cell. They're stiffer cells. And they're a little bit shorter generally. A spirochete is a helical organism in three dimensions. It's like a helix. It tends to be longer. They tend to be more flexible, more twists and turns to a spirochete. All right. We don't have a lot of time left, just a minute. So um, I just want you to take a look at a clinical specimen here. We're gonna look at some urine. Now this is urine sediment. When a person gives a urine specimen at the doctor's office and that specimen goes to the microbiology lab, it's gonna be put into a centrifuge so that any particulate matter in the urine will be pulled down to the bottom of the tube. And then a sample of that sediment, as it's called, will be put onto a microscope slide and examined. Now it's hard to see because it's not stained. This is a wet mount of the, of the sediment. Ah, hmm. What's the shape? What shape of cell do you see here? What shape do you see on that in that sediment? These are bacterial cells. We're under the 100x lens. So a thousand X total magnification. And I've got some bacteria in this sediment. What do you think? What's the shape? Lisa's got it. Maddie's got it. Good. Those are cocci. Those are spherical shaped cells. Remember, they're three dimensional. They're like balls. That's a coccus or a cocci. Now, remember, I can't tell you what organism that is. I can tell you what the shape is and the relative size, but I couldn't possibly tell you what the genus and species is. No, I would have to do a lot more testing to do that. But I can at least report back to the physician that there are a lot of coccus shaped cells in the sediment of that urine. 
it looks like that patient has a bacterial infection. Now take a look at this. This is also urine sediment. This is also a wet mount. Mm, this is hard to see, isn't it? This isn't stained. Have I convinced you that staining is useful? <laughs> Again, I've got some bacterial cells here, but what do you think? Do you think these are cocci or do you think these are rods, bacillus or rods? If you had to call it, <laughs> which one would you guess? What do you think? Do you think you're looking at spherical cells, round cells, or are you looking at elongated rods or bacillus? Look all around, look all around that slide. Ah, we have a, we have a disagreement. Um, some people are saying rod, some people are saying caucus. These are actually rods. They're short, stubby rods. You would be forgiven for thinking they might be cocci. These are short, little stubby rods. This is E. coli. E. coli is a very short little rod, <laughs> but it is a rod. Now, let me tell you how, you how you would know that this was not a caucus. If I look at certain cells like this one, it sure looks round to me. If I go down here, that's a round looking cell. If you see a round cell, don't immediately guess caucus. Keep looking. If I look right here, I see two cells in a chain, but these cells are definitely rods. So what do I do? I've got two different shapes, really. I've got some round and I've got some rods. The reason some of these look round is because you're looking at the cell end on. You're looking at the end of the cell. In other words, I'm looking at this rod from the side and I'm looking at this rod from its end. Remember, this is a drop of fluid. So these cells are floating around and sometimes you're gonna get a view from the side and sometimes you're gonna get a view from the end. If you see rods, if you see any rod shaped cells, you know you have rods. The only way it's a caucus is if all the cells are round. Okay, if you see any rods, you know you have a rod. That's the trick. But hopefully I've convinced you that it is not easy to tell what you've got unless you stain. Ah, uh, look what else we found in the urine. What do you think this is? Again, wet mount, 100X lens, unstained, wet mount, urine. What do you think that is? We've seen this before. What else does this patient have in their urine? Oh, Austin's asking a good question about chaining. Do we see any chaining with those rods? Yeah, there are definitely a couple of chains in there. Remember Austin and everyone, bacillus or rod-shaped organisms, they tend to chain. They tend to form chains. Urine is really dilute though, generally speaking. So we don't see as elongated chains as we might in a culture. So I have a couple of guests, guess, guesses <laughs> for yeast. What do you think? What is this? We've seen this before. What is in this patient's urine? This is a fungus, right? This is a fungus. And what I can see here are long sort of tree-like branches. And I can also see circular cells coming off the sides and the ends of those branches. Remember, under the microscope, a fungus can take two forms. It can be a branched uh, mold, 
That's what the tree is. And it can also take a single cellular form called a yeast. So the tree-like looking structure, that's mold. And what's budding off of it is called yeast. This patient has a yeast in its urine, has a fungus in its urine. Here's the interesting thing though. Do you think this person necessarily has a fungal infection in their bladder? If I found a fungus in a urine specimen, do I have evidence that they have a fungal infection in their bladder? Remember, it's actually somewhat unusual to have a fungal infection as a human. It's not unheard of, of course, but most pathogens are bacteria and viruses. If this person came in and we did, let's say a routine urinalysis, maybe they're there for their physical, and I saw that bit of fungus in their urine sediment. Am I thinking bladder infection right away or no? Where else might a little bit of yeast come from, generally speaking? Could it be that this is not bladder infection, but a little contamination? If I'm sent into the, into the restroom and I'm asked to get a, a urine specimen, and generally we do these clean catch, remember? You send the patient into the bathroom with a cup. You tell them to clean themselves off a little bit, pee in the cup, give it to the technician. Very, very common to find a little bit of fungus in there, a little bit of yeast. And that's because we have yeast on our skin, especially in our genital area, in, our, in the area of our genitals, in our perineum, which is the space um, around your genital openings. Very, very common to find yeast down there. And so when a patient urinates, they often pull those surface yeast into their urine sample. This patient probably does not have a yeast infection in their bladder. This was probably a contaminant that came off their skin. Reading urinalyses are, um, are, can be challenging. Um, it takes a lot of experience. You have to learn what is a real infection and what is just um, a contaminant. Now, if that patient's urine was loaded with yeast, if that patient's urine was just full of yeast, it would be different. But if I came across an occasional yeast in a urine sample, it's probably just a contaminant. All right, last but not least, I have one more to show you. This is also a clinical specimen. This came from what we call a buffy coat smear. If you've ever worked in a laboratory, when we take blood samples, we can spin the blood in a centrifuge and we can separate out the red blood cells from the white blood cells. And that's what we did here. The white blood cell layer is called the buffy coat. And as you can see, these enormous cells, these are eukaryotic cells. So they're huge. These are white blood cells. We're under the 100X lens, so they look enormous. These are neutrophils, mostly. White blood cells. Ah, but look at this. These cells that are around the white blood cells are rod shaped bacteria. This patient is very, very sick. This patient is, is um, in the ICU because that patient has bacteria in their bloodstream and the bloodstream should never have bacteria in it. So this patient has a condition called sepsis. This patient had a bacterial infection somewhere in their body and the bacteria gained entry into the blood. And let me tell you, blood 
is a perfect medium to grow bacteria in. If you get bacteria into your blood, the bacteria are gonna grow very well in there because blood is very nutritious. So this patient has bacteria growing in their bloodstream. We call that sepsis and is very, very ill. Rod shaped bacteria in here, chaining. These are large bacteria. This is probably Bacillus megatherium. Big, huge bacterial cells, rod shaped cells in here. All right, I've kept you over. I apologize for that. I kept you over a little bit. Remember, you have a quiz to do on simple staining. Sorry, you have a quiz to do on your lecture material that's due by Wednesday night. You have another quiz due Friday night on lecture material. You can't do your lab homework yet. You have to wait until after Wednesday's lab to do your lab homework. But you can certainly work on your lectures. And I will see you again on Wednesday morning. Okay? All right, everybody. Have a good rest of the day, and I'll see you on Wednesday.